So our first speaker today is uh, Phil Zadden. He came all the way from New Zealand to us. He is professor at the University of Otago, the Department of Zoology, and he's director of the Postgraduate Wildlife Management Program. His research focuses on the restoration of threatened species, in reintroduction biology, including assisted colonization, and other conservation introductions. He's a member of the IUCN Species Survival Commission, and he was involved in uh, uh, making the guidelines for uh, uh, reintroduction, but also uh, the guidelines on the extinction uh, as a conservation benefit. And uh, he also worked and advised species restoration project around the world, and he will talk today about <laughs> the history of assisted colonization and the IUCN guidelines. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I was talking to Kent Redford, who's our second speaker this morning. We both said we really have no expertise in corals. Uh, certainly enjoy them when I go diving and snorkeling. So we felt that our role this morning is first up here is kind of a warm-up act, so I hope I can manage to warm you up. What I'd like to do is think about the development of these riskier translocation options. So I'm going to give you a bit of history as to how the thinking about reintroductions, reintroduction biology changed to encompass the idea of actually moving things outside of their, their historical range. We'll start with of a hot water bottle. This was um, from the uh, McElhaney Company, and back in 1895, Ed or Ned McElhaney, who was the developer of uh, this, this kind of iconic bottle, took it upon himself to uh, develop a, a, a large refuge area in southern Louisiana, really to save uh, snowy egrets and possibly he saved them from extinction. They were being threatened by uh, harvest, really, for feathers for the hat trade. And he banded hundreds of thousands of birds and set up a captive breeding program and a release program from this very large reserve area that he, he called Bird City. Possibly one of the very first conservation translocations we can think of. But on the other side of the world, a man, um, was doing something very similar. So Richard Henry was an Irishman who came to New Zealand uh, and took on a number of jobs, a number of roles. But one of them was he was made the warden of an island down in Fiordland, the, the southwest part of New Zealand. And he took a great interest in the wildlife around him. And he was horrified to observe the arrival of stoats that had been introduced to the east, moving across to the west. And as the stoats arrived, the native bird uh, fauna around him started to disappear. And he started to move species such as kakapo and kiwi from the mainland onto offshore Resolution Island in, a, in an effort to save them. Uh, so again, one of the very first conservation translocations perhaps in the world. His efforts were ultimately in vain. The island was too close to the mainland and stoats invaded and uh, all the birds that had moved had were, were killed. He was uh, distraught by this, left Fiordland never to return again, and uh, actually died in an insane asylum up in Auckland. It took a little while before the idea of reintroductions really kicked off anywhere, but there were a number of high profile success stories, if you like, such as Golden Lion Tamarin, Peregrine Falcon in the US, Arabian Oryx in the Uh, this last one uh, organized or championed by Mark Stanley Price, who became the first chair of the, the new IUCN reintroduction specialist group, and wrote a very influential book called Animal Reintroduction, using the Arabian Oryx as a case study. <clears throat> the reintroduction specialist group had its mission to combat loss of biodiversity by using reintroductions as a restoration tool. And very early on, they produced a very simple document these 1998 guidelines for reintroductions, really a, a very slim tome, probably about 10 pages in all, uh, 
And in talking to Mark, he said it was really put together over a couple of days by a couple of people in around, around a couple of days. But these were hugely influential. They started to give people a, a, a sense of the kinds of things you need to do to plan for reintroductions. And you saw an explosion of, of reintroduction attempts. So what the reintroduction specialist group was trying to do was combat uh, poorly planned or poorly thought out efforts to restore species by moving them around with, with harmful outcomes. So the guidelines were informing um, a number of projects and we're seeing an expansion in the range of uh, countries in different, in different parts of the world, uh, different taxa that are the focus of them. Can summarize it by looking at this. Um, just looking at the, uh, this graph up here first uh, shows us some interesting patterns. So the the dark bar are species translocated and the, the open bars are species in nature. And what we can see from this is that there's a, a taxonomic bias, a taxonomic bias that we've seen uh, a number of things whereby we tend to focus on mammals and birds and we don't do much on other species, uh, other, other taxa. And it's no mystery why this is. The, this taxonomic bias exists in conservation, it exists in, in research. And it's because we're attracted to charismatic species. The other thing this figure is showing us is the distribution of effort around the world. And again, not surprisingly, most of it is in, in fairly de developed areas, North America, Europe, with a big block in, in um, Oceania. Uh, a lot of things in New Zealand, we have over, over now over 55 New Zealand bird species, just birds alone have been moved in over a thousand releases. And we have species that exist in the wild only because they've been the subject of a, a restoration or reintroduction. Talking about translocation, talking about reintroduction, but I think it's useful to kind of define a few things and unpack this a little. So a translocation is defined as human mediated movement of living organisms from one area, importantly with release in another. So those individuals could come from a captive program, they could come from wild, be a wild to wild, the key thing is that you're releasing them somewhere else. So captive to captive wouldn't count as a translocation in a sense. We can think about there being a spectrum of translocation options. And we can ask and answer some questions to, to, to dissect what it is we're, we're proposing to do. So that first question is, is that release intentional? If we said no, there are such things as accidental translocations, rats stowing away on ships. They're being moved, they've ended up being released, we didn't intend it, uh, but that's the consequence. And we said, yeah, it's actually we're in doing this intentionally. The next question is, why are you doing this? Is the primary objective of doing this to perhaps in, improve the status of the species you're moving or to do something around restoring ecosystems? So we consider this to be kind of encompassing conservation benefit. And again, we could say, no, there are other reasons why we move things around, and this is a not exhaustive list, um, moving problem animals from one place to another, maybe individuals that have become habituated, uh, that are creating a problem, take them somewhere else. Rehabilitation, so these are African penguins that have been oiled, collected from one place, moved to another. Um, religious reasons, so in large parts of Southeast Asia, across a number of different religious beliefs, it's felt that you recorded um, uh, kudos for releasing animals and, they, and temples will hold uh, animal release prayer ceremonies and animals will be captured and brought in from all sorts of environments and then released, uh, not really caring about uh, where you're releasing things. So marine species might be released into fresh water or vice versa, but the idea is release. Um, animal rights liberation, so mink, uh, liberating mink um, from captivity. Aesthetic is another one there. Um, New Zealand has filled with uh, introduced bird species by early British colonists who decided they wanted to recreate the kind of British, British landscape, British garden. And other, so there are other things, and the most weird one I've found is, is this, is the idea um, in World War II, the Americans uh, experimented with the idea of producing bat bombs. So they got bats from Texas, moved them to California. The idea was that they would tie tiny incendiary devices to their legs, 
and drop them en masse over Japan, and bats being bats would go in under the wooden eaves of the Japanese buildings, supposedly gnaw their incendiary devices off, but I'm not sure that was necessary a requirement, and set a thousand fires. Fortunately, they never implemented this, but it did mean releases of bats from Texas into California. If we said yes, actually, we're doing this for conservation reasons. What we're doing is a conservation translocation, and we can ask the question, okay, well, where are you releasing these things? Are you releasing them within the indigenous range? And the indigenous range is defined here as known or inferred distribution generated from historical records or physical evidence of the species occurrence. It's, it's to escape the idea of talking about historical distribution because uh, some people have objected to that and saying, well, whose history you're talking about? Does this have to be documented by Western science or, or what counts? We say, um, yes, we're releasing things inside the indigenous range. What we're doing is a population restoration. We can ask the question, are there still any of these this species still in the area that you're releasing them? Here we go. Well, yes, there are some. So what we're doing is a reinforcement. Uh, the intentional movement released into a population of conservation for conservation benefit. The example here is Kaki or black stilt, which is an endemic wading bird in central South Island, so a braided river specialist. Uh, went down to about 23 individuals in the 1980s um, and is, is back up to about 124, so still critically endangered. Um, not possible to manage this on offshore islands where we've taken predators off because we don't have islands with braided rivers on them. So we're managing them in situ uh, through a process of reinforcement while we experiment with ways to manage predator control. It's actually, uh, there are no conflicts that are left in that area. They've all gone local extirpation, local extinction. What you're doing is a reintroduction. So the intentional movement and release inside the indigenous range uh, from what that or from where that species has disappeared. So the example here is South Island saddleback. Um, again, uh, a species that was lost from the mainland at one point due to introduced predators, existed only on some offshore islands, which were then invaded by rats. And it was really one of the start of um, uh, serial translocations to actually save a species in New Zealand in the 1960s and 70s. Populations now built up uh, to nearly 2,000 birds and a number of safe sites around the country. We've been talking about fairly standard uh, things, so reinforcements, reintroductions, nothing too contra controversial there. But we have these new guidelines, and we felt those the original guidelines were a little too limited. There were many more things we needed to think about, and also there was a wider spectrum of activities that we felt needed to come under the idea of conservation translocation. So the guidelines are called Guidelines for reintroductions and other conservation translocations. And they place a great emphasis on matching species to habitat if you're interested in translocation success, uh, regardless of where that, that habitat sits within historical range or anywhere else. The emphasis really is on saying, is this area suitable in terms of food, predators, parasites, whatever required for persistence of that focal species? And one of the things is, is strongly recognized is that these things aren't static. Habitats change, they vary over space and time. So the idea of choosing an arbitrary historical restoration target point makes no sense. We don't, there's no, no point trying to go back a hundred years or a thousand years. Things have changed. And one of the things that have changed is where that area of suitable habitat is. The consequences of this, and there are four, and I'll just pick them apart here, but basically where things may have been in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it currently the best areas. Where things are today doesn't mean that that's the best place they could be. Where they're absent doesn't mean that it's not potentially suitable. And where they are today doesn't mean that it's going to be good for them into the future. So just to illustrate some of that, the historical locations might not indicate present day suitability. The invasion of uh, introduced predators such as the Australian brush-tail possum has been rapid and has completely changed habitat suitability for a number of species. So historically, we may have had species distributed right across New Zealand. That habitat is no longer suitable because it's filled with these mammalian predators. We think about Hawaiian endemics that sit on these, these high uh, 
elevation areas, really to avoid the impact of uh, mosquitoes causing avian malaria. If you could remove that, alien, uh, that avian malaria threat, you would, you would not look at this current distribution and say, well, the best place for them is in these high tops. You could look at other kind of evidence and say, actually, these are lowland species birds, and that would be the best place for them. <laughs> the idea that um, where a species is absent doesn't mean it's a bad area. This is Takahe, a species that was thought to be extinct but was rediscovered in a small valley in Fiordland in the 1940s. And for a long time it was felt this was, you know, archetypical, the best habitat, uh, the last refuge. But it's not atypical for species to disappear from the core of their range and be left into, left into these kind of remnant relic uh, margins. And in fact, if we look at uh, the dots on this map, are the subfossil remains from Takahe, we can see they had a much wider distribution. And what's happened is translocations of Takahe right up into Northland uh, have been successful, so these birds are much more adaptable than we had thought. And of course, present day locations may not indicate future suitability, so climate change changes habitat suitability, and, and this is the big, big, big game changer here. I, uh, search for a marine example just uh, for, you, for you, so I hope you appreciate this. Uh, just to think about how, how things change and they change species distribution. So this is looking at the southern coast of Africa, South Africa, um, and thinking about the, the Benguela ecosystem here. So this current that sweeps around here. And uh, when I worked in South Africa a number of years ago, I was working on, on seabird colonies that were up and down this coast here. Uh, hugely abundant colonies. What's happened um, at the time I was there, and since, since I was there, is if we look at commercially uh, exploited species, but also used by the seabirds, we've seen a distribution shift moving around the southern coast, really stranding some of these seabird colonies there. Uh, the result is massive declines in the number of birds that are occupying those areas. So this is data for Dyer Island, just off the coast here. You won't necessarily see it. There's a tiny dot up there, which is called Dusson Island, where I did a, a bit of field work. Um, this is a photo of Dusson Island in the 1950s. And if you just keep that rock in mind that that man's standing on, this is Dusson Island today. The massive changes in habitat suitability are, are possible for a number of reasons. Uh, another place I worked was in uh, the Middle East. You could look at the Middle East. These are projections climate projections, different times of the year, future. Basically, note that it's going to get hotter. Uh, no surprise there. What we have are a number of endemic species that have very restricted ranges. So the Yemen serum, Yemen warbler, these, these long, narrow ranges. No surprise, what they do is they sit along this Asia mountain range. So these species are in the process of what we call falling off the top. Things, things are getting hotter uh, and they're running out of habitat. A little closer to where I am now, so this is in, in Queensland in Australia. Golden Bowerbird is a, is a mountain endemic, again, uh, in high elevation areas, but also in the process of falling off the top. Uh, to move to cooler areas in the south is not possible for it because it can't spread across the intervening lowland areas, uh, which are too hot. So what to do for species in these kinds of situations? In 2008, uh, it came out that suggested we should be thinking about assisted colonization. And they, they made the statement, resource managers must contemplate moving species to sites where they do not currently occur or have been known to occur. They said this, uh, stated this as a climate change mitigation, and they set out a little decision tree, uh, really, to start the discussion. The discussion had been started earlier, looking back at the literature, actually back in 1985, I, I found this paper uh, by Robert Peters and Joan Darling, and they're talking about reserve areas. Uh, very forward thinking, I think, in 1985. And they're saying, well, climate warming may change the suitability of reserves so that you have isolated populations in reserves, and they may not be able to respond to changing climate conditions by colonizing habitat outside the reserve. So what you need to think about is um, possibly transferring them to new reserves that might be outside their current range. The invasion biologists hated this idea. They came out very strongly against it. 
with some statements such as increased consideration of assisted colonization will create more conservation problems than it solves. Sorry, my name, I'm getting a bit of feedback from the, the microphone. It's just a bit of echo. Or assisted colonization poses potentially great and largely incalculable risks. The potential of assisted colonization to preserve species stands in direct tension with its potential to unleash invasion by the focal species. So these are pretty hard words. And there was a feeling that translocation of species to habitats outside of that range is a major divergence from traditional conservation. So uh, is, it, is it a major divergence? Well, well, we felt it was not, and it needed to be incorporated in these guidelines. So we come down to this line, we say, are you doing a release within the indigenous range? If the answer is no, then what we might be doing is a conservation introduction. We recognised um, valid conservation reason for moving things outside the species, outside the range. So, if the aim is to release the, uh, of the release is to avoid population extinction at any scale, you could be doing an assisted colonisation uh, defined by uh, others as translocation of species to favourable habitat beyond their native range to protect them from human-induced threats such as climate change. So not restricted only to climate change, maybe other threats at least, and I'll talk about some of those. Uh, so our, our, our UTM definition is ended there. Uh, people felt this was, this was something new, it was something dangerous, but in fact, we've been doing it for a while in New Zealand, and Richard Henry was probably doing it in moving Kakapo to an offshore island where they've not necessarily been before. Kakapo, a flightless, or weird actually, flightless nocturnal lecking parrot. So we talked, we didn't talk about assisted colonization, we talked about marooning, actually taking, taking vulnerable species from the mainland that was becoming filled with predators and putting them on islands where it was possible to remove all predators. The Perea pine, it's a, a species that sits in a Pleistocene refuge in Florida. There are very few individuals and it's been threatened by warming temperatures there. There's actually a, a non-governmental group who's taken it upon themselves to consider an assisted colonization of moving these into cool climates within the states. You think about butterflies in the UK, so colonies do naturally move, but they're not keeping up with climate change. So there have been experimental movements of at least two species of butterfly uh, into areas. And in Australia, an interesting example is uh, Tasmanian devil. This is Tasmania, island at the bottom of Australia. And the Tasmanian devil population there has been threatened by a socially transmitted cancer, a facial cancer. So Tasmanian devil facial human disease is working its way through that population. And it was felt there was a need to create a disease-free insurance population on an offshore island where devils have never been before. So this fits our definition of sister colonization. So I'm thinking about kind of future scenarios, um, hihi, a stitch bird, so another native in New Zealand, and making a case for the need for assisted colonization. So uh, these are the current hihi populations within New Zealand, this is the ground. Um, we can uh, model, uh, in fact, what they did was they combined uh, species distribution modeling with demographic modeling to look at uh, population performance and persistence in different regions and identified uh, under current, current area what, where the suitable habitat would be and the unsuitable habitat and then projected that forward under a number of different climate scenarios. And the thing to note really is that you move from suitable areas up into here and further and further down into the top part of that South Island. So trying to anticipate where that future suitable habitat might lie. The same thing has been done for Kukara, so it's a, um, a dinosaur era relic, not of the dinosaurs, but of a group called the Rhynchocephalia. Um, persists in a number of places in New Zealand, so if you can see the, uh, the blue areas, basically offshore islands here and up in the north there are the remnant populations. But there are uh, 
natural, natural deposits, uh, fossil remains and known or probable extinction sites. So you can uh, look at habitat suitability based on, on uh, so it's a simple correlative model uh, using a, a number of different approaches. So BRT is boosted regression trees, uh, generalized um, additive models, or the program Maxent, which is the one that's um, a pseudo-absence model, and look at suitability. And if we just take Maxent results, we can think about uh, some scenarios whereby up here we we base the modeling on more and more data, so this is based on where existing populations are, and we know why that may be misleading. This is based on uh, other policy deposits, and this is based on known or probable extinction sites. And across this way, we think about uh, different climate change scenarios so that we can anticipate where that suitable habitat might lie. Important for something such as Tuatara, which has sex dependent, uh, temperature dependent sex determination. So you have areas that get too, too cold or too warm, you end up getting a, a huge sex bias. And similar for Western Swamp, so down in that corner of Australia, where you have a population that's uh, sitting in one point here, which under any projection is going to become completely unsuitable, and you need to think about other areas you could be moving there. So where are we now with views about assisted colonization? The guidelines have been out for a number of years. Uh, there's more and more activity. People are taking this seriously. Certainly climate change has been the big driver for thinking about how do we save species in areas that are becoming increasingly unsuitable. And for species that cannot, cannot colonize suitable areas uh, because of their, their biology, their ecology, or because of barriers. So some quotes here, it's likely that many species will need assisted colonization or dispersal assistance may be needed for many species under a wide range of possible future climates. And assisted colonization is one way of facilitating range shift for species that are restricted in their ability to move in response to climate change. So we're seeing more and more kind of acceptance of this as a tool, but awareness too that this comes with uncertainty and risk. So I'll leave you with the last quote, that risk to recipient ecosystem may be viewed by stakeholders, because this isn't just done by conservation practitioners or scientists, it's the wider public as well, may be viewed by stakeholders sufficiently large, these risks may be sufficiently large, so as to never accept this assisted colonization as a valid conservation strategy, even if it means extinction of a species. Thank you very much. Risk is always uh, dependent on who you're talking to. So some people will consider some risks to be minor, others will consider them to be totally overwhelming. And what we're proposing as, a, as the reintroduction specialist group is, is that you use frameworks such as structured decision making really to bring all the stakeholders into the room and to follow a very kind of ordered process to understand what it is that's important to different people and to set those as what we call kind of fundamental objectives. And you may have a number of those things. So one of your objectives might be around saving the species, but it equally could be one that's around uh, ensuring that you don't damage that ecosystem or that you don't damage human livelihoods or that you don't have these other outcomes. So you're keeping all those things in mind when you look at alternative ways to try and get at these, these scenarios. So one alternative is always do nothing and that's an action or status quo. Other alternatives may be very intensive interventions and they will carry different risks and those different risks will be perceived by people differently. But there are ways in order to, to summarize 
quantifying in some way people's degree of comfort with different kinds of risks and come out with a, an answer which uh, may be the best compromise. Mm -hmm. um, in the report, we something have suggested that we consider moving towards policy at least where the water is extremely warm to very valuable for other in the Pacific regions. And of course, there's a, a number of uh, potential risks associated with that. But also, what I'm interested in to hear from you, have you been involved or do you know of any assisted colonization um, initiative that, of course, countries, um, both countries that are both multiple countries, that's sort of the, the legalities and <laughs> the issues associated with yeah. evolving more than a single country? Because that's yeah, when we think about coal reasons, right. colonization that's likely to happen, and how do we deal with that? Even within a country, I imagine it's very mm. For assisted colonization, no. What I didn't talk about here was the other kind of conservation introduction, and that's ecological replacement. So it's where you're saying we've lost a species, we can't bring it back because it's gone, but it did something useful in that environment. So can we find uh, a surrogate or a proxy of that species that will do that same function. And people have moved things uh, from uh, thinking giant tortoises from essentially from one country to another in those instances, and saying we want to restore, I was talking about it yesterday to some of the people here, we want to restore um, those good things that tortoises used to do in that environment, but we don't have the, the indigenous species anymore. So that may, be the, that may be the closest one to look at. But of course, there are going to be, you know, I, I think the, the further away you go, the greater that risk and uncertainty. You know, if you're just talking about, let's just hop it over here and jump it over the road or, you know, put it on an island just offshore, very different from saying, let's move things from one boundary to another. Um, very provocatively, people have talked about Pleistocene rewilding. And that is like a massive ecological replacement where you say things that have been lost, uh, 10,000 years ago, we could find surrogates for them and bring, bring African species into North America. So, again, there are interesting debates around this. Mm. Yeah, I would like to follow up on that. So, regardless whether it's the uh, ecological placement, yeah. I think where we really need to discuss partially what's that stuff, at least for the coral people. Yeah. Very interesting. But regardless whether it's that or <clears throat> Recolonization. Uh, and I think a big open issue is the international governance regime and mm -hmm. the regime, right? Mm -hmm. So, do you have any idea how that could be made? If we're working, uh, do some working uh, uh, body of, of decision makers at the, at the international scene? Because that makes sense, right? Before, before that has been implemented, I think, well, across boundaries, yes. Be, it, not, not yeah. Done, except you just do it. Right. Yeah, I don't think those. I don't think those frameworks are in place yet. I think people have been talking about this within national boundaries. Uh, so it, it's something that needs to happen. It doesn't really sit under. It may sit under CITES or something like that. But you consider this to be a trade. I don't know. It's certainly a cross-border movement. But the fundamental difference is that there's this release at the other end. So it's not a kind of a captive to captive thing. And in the marine environment. Much more challenging, much more challenging. Yeah, any more questions here? Yeah. So we also have a question from the outside, and um, my fear is asking how has this disease interaction been discussed in the risk definition? Disease interaction? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly one of those one of those considerations. So um, It'll be one of the lines in there we think about in this structure decision making. So saying, actually, one of our fundamental things we don't want to raise that disease risk. So what are these alternatives doing in terms of disease risk across there? So you can factor that in. Very hard to kind of anticipate though, because this is something else that is changing there. Yeah, uh, it, it's a it's a it is along a spectrum. Any kind of movement or release or reintroduction is runs the risk of moving new pathogens into an environment or exposing your released animal to pathogens that it hasn't been exposed to, particularly if you're coming from captive to wild situations. Yeah. 
This brings up the interesting question to not just the marine environment, also the terrestrial environment, there's of course unintentional movements of you know, say ships, mm -hmm. ship hauls or yeah. airplanes or what have you. And so how is the distinction made? And I can I can see that you know uh, there's several you know, interest groups who would say, you know, your regulatory requirements on us are really burdensome and now you're going ahead and moving things anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, why do we so it might undermine biosecurity, yeah. uh, because they say, "Well, you're moving that, and we're moving this." So how, how's that? Are you still dealing with those kind of questions? I'm not aware of. I'm not aware of that as a discussion, but it's a very good one. It's an interesting one. I think it. I think the if you're doing a system colonization, you're you're thinking about a very specific species that you're moving, and there will be a, a requirement for monitoring. The guidelines talk about requirements for exit strategies. So if things don't go right, how do you how do you pull back? I don't know how you would do that in the marine environment necessarily. Easier for a mammal or a bird, perhaps, that went extinct somewhere. You just go and make it extinct again if you if you had to. But uh, challenging, yeah, Kent. Thank you. Uh, so your focus of your talk was on the species that are in Yes. So. The two questions I have are what how do we consider genes mm. moving genes without the species which now we do? And the second is what about moving microbiomes but leaving the species the same? And are you are you anticipating your talk? It's just one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that's kind of a lead it into <laughs> We, uh, Kent, Kent and I Kent have had a very interesting discussion about the rising importance of microbiomes, and there's been an early, early suggestion. I think it might have even come from Kent, but um, some of the some of the reintroduction failures may not have been a habitat mismatch; it might have been a microbiome mismatch. And I think what we're going to see in the next few years is much more consideration of, of the fact that you're not moving. A single organism, you're moving a little ecosystem, and and all that that entails. Uh, in the, there tend to be a history in New Zealand uh, for a while. Vets would get involved, and and say, well, if you're moving this thing from captive facility, we need to give it either meth or whatever. We need to completely scour it out of everything and throw it out there. There's more of a realization now that actually some of the parasites are, are as important as anything. And in the, I wrote an opinion piece with some colleagues saying in terms of de-extinction, what about the, the very specific parasites that, that you might need to bring back as well? So I think this idea of thinking about you know, individuals as, as ecosystems and everything that entails is important. Yeah. Uh, let me go back to the species question. Uh, so most of the examples are charismatic. Mm. Species that appear to the public, and there's of course nothing wrong with it. But can you think about a more system and, and uh, of course resources and time of conservation is this limited? So, is, is there any decision framework in place, or can you conceive a decision framework that prioritizes uh, among, among the species? And uh, 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 how is it current? And how is it happening currently? Is it just a hazard? So, the yeah. public perceives one species that's particularly. Yeah. Charismatic, so and then the focus is by lobbying directly. Yeah. So, that so in New Zealand, for example, we have 4,000 endangered species, and we work on less than 200 of them, and not necessarily the most endangered because we work on the most charismatic ones. And this has been re recognized as a problem. Mm -hmm. So, for the last eight or more years, there's been attempts to come up with prioritization based on a number of criteria. Which might be, you know, um, uh, evolutionary unique pathways, endemicity, um, uh, functional role, but also what do people feel about it? Because you don't want a list like that. You know, if we, we produce a list like that, the first few hundred species would be fungi and bryophytes, and people go, "Where's my favourite bird in that list?" Mm -hmm. So you need you need to be able to factor in what people will engage with and support but not to the, the extent of throwing out all the other kind of diversity that's in there, the species diversity. 
Um, so trying to do it, the Australians are trying to do it now. They've done that for New South Wales as well, that same kind of prioritisation exercise. And I understand that um, the people who are doing that in New Zealand have been talking to people in the States about the, those kind of processes. Ken. So I think that we have to remember that agriculture and forestry have been moving species and microorganisms around a lot. And so that the conservation community sort of discovered this, but it's been going on for a long time in a parallel set of activities. That, that I don't know whether you guys have had that much of a connection, but I think we have a lot to learn from those two fields that have been doing this much more extensive. Yes, of course, there have been a lot of movements there. It would be interesting to see the extent to which they were interested in other kinds of outcomes, or whether there were un, un, you know, deleterious effects for the recipient ecosystem, as opposed to commercial or whatever games. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, 